Pariyati Audiobooks presents The Struggle of Letting Go A story by Suvimali Karunaratna Narrated by Sophia Oja with Christoph Enslin The Struggle of Letting Go A Story Kapuri, the she-elephant, noticed that a new dog, or rather a new dam, had come into the temple premises. There were, of course, two canines residing there already, Kalu and Sudu. When the new dam walked in, somewhat timidly at first, Kapuri noticed that Sudu became greatly agitated. She growled, and snarled and barked to no end at the newcomer, despite the latter's gentle demeanor, and even tried to attack her. The newcomer, whose name was Suki, settled herself down with great composure and decorum under the bow tree. Please go away, she told Sudu, when Sudu came up to her, barking all the while. I have only come here to meditate. So they all say at the start, Sudu said, snarling. I know all those tricks and tactics, but once they have a toehold here, they begin to behave as if they own the place. Be off with you. There's no room for the likes of you here. Who says so? Kalu asked, coming up to them. Who says there's no room? Sudu became livid with rage. You keep out of this. The conversation here is entirely between me and that creature over there. What have you got to do with it? Kalu shrugged. I'm just a peacemaker, that's all. This is not a home for wretched destitutes who bring in all manner of mangy diseases. Sudu continued. And don't you be filling the whole place with pups? Suki ignored her, and Sudu finally left her in peace. Though thereafter, she always remained on a war footing with Suki, taking umbrage at all kinds of imagined transgressions. She even laid down rules for Suki to observe. Suki was to keep a wide berth from the monk's residential quarters and the kitchen, and confine herself to the tree area and the meditation hall only, which Suki would have done in any case. However, the temple stewards and the meditators were very kind and always gave Suki leftovers from their food so she didn't starve. In due course, it was not Suki but Sudu who gave birth to a litter of pups, She delivered four pups, and a few days after the event, Suki decided to visit them. She approached them warily, uncertain of Sudu's reaction to her. How are you? Suki asked from afar. And the new arrivals? All right, came the cool reply. Don't come closer. You might frighten them. Don't worry. I won't, Suki said a trifle hurt. I'll keep my distance. Good. For a minute or two, Suki watched them wistfully. She adored pups and longed to lick and cuddle them. When Suki returned to the bow tree courtyard, she sat and wondered why Sudu resented her presence with such intensity. How was she getting in Sudu's way? Suki had had her fair share of troubles in life and now all she wanted was a little place where she could sit down and meditate in peace. Don't worry about Sudu, said Kapuri kindly to Suki over the parapet wall that surrounded the bow tree area. How did you know I was thinking of her? I have eyes and ears, and I wasn't born yesterday. 
It is difficult to ignore rudeness, Sukhi said. Don't waste your valuable time, my dear, Kapuri advised. Suddhu is a victim of excessive papancha. What's that? Kapuri looked at the tortoise who was close by near the edge of the bow tree. You tell her, she said. Well, you see, we are all subject to papancha. The tortoise explained. But some of us are victims of it more than others. To put it in a nutshell, papancha is the wrong way of looking at things. But why are we all victims of it? Because we see things subjectively, through ego-tinted glasses, from the point of view of I and me and mine. Our view is blurred by all kinds of prejudices, complexes, fears, false premises and conjectures, which all stem from the notion of an ego. So, how can we see things in the correct way? The purpose of mental culture is to purify our minds of defilements so we can clean our lenses, so to speak, and see things clearly rather than through ego-tinted glasses. But I don't do any wrong here. At least I'm not aware that I do any wrong. Why should my presence cause Sudhu to resent me? Maybe... She sees your tendency to cling. You see, we all have clinging. There's no denying that. So maybe she thinks you may cling to the objects of her clinging, over which she wants exclusive rights. Therefore, you pose a threat to her. If that's the way she thinks... Perhaps I should leave this place. Then she can have exclusive rights to this place and to everything here. Running away from unpleasant situations is not a solution. Wherever you go, there will be people you don't like or people who don't like you or situations you don't like. It is better to train your mind in such a way that you do not have excessive yearning for people or things you like, or excessive aversion to people or things you dislike. You must train your mind to be unperturbed at all times. Oh. Now try to discipline your thoughts and cultivate metta, loving-kindness, so that you won't react to Sudhu's acts of aggression and aversion to you. It sounds difficult, but I'll try. Very good. That method is really better than going away from this place. Think what an excellent opportunity you have here to train your mind in acquiring equanimity. I know. I have seen so many who run away from unpleasant situations created by those like Suddhu, Kapuri observed. And I have also seen victims ultimately ending up worse than the victimizers. They revile the victimizers so much that they make just as much unwholesome karma for themselves from their aversion as the victimizers do from theirs. I must confess, I do have a tendency to run away from unpleasant situations, Suki admitted, but I don't make a habit of reviling others. Good, but this time, try not to run away. Discipline your mind to be equanimous. Cultivating metta helps a lot. But sometimes... If the conditions are really uncongenial, 
isn't it more advisable to leave? Even the Buddha left when the conditions were really uncongenial. What you say is true. One has to judge and see if a place is conducive to one's own well-being and the well-being of others. If one is really earnest about cultivating mindfulness and concentration and working out one's deliverance from samsara, then a place of solitude is better than uncongenial surroundings loaded with tensions. That is why a householder's spiritual progress is considered gradual, whereas a hermit, if earnest, can advance more quickly. Of course, it goes without saying there have been householders who have attained the path and hermits who have not. I shall have to think this out carefully, Suki said, knitting her brows. This is such an ideal place in which to meditate. And yet, it is just my luck that even here there has to be a fly in the ointment. Kapuri smiled. It is always like that, my dear. That is dukkha, separation from the pleasant, association with the unpleasant, and having unfulfilled yearnings. When the pups grew up, try as she might, Sudhu couldn't keep them all to herself. They would stray away, giving full vent to their curiosity about their surroundings. They would sometimes come bounding to where Suki was seated under the bow tree to observe her with great interest. One particular saucy pup who had a black patch over one eye came right up to her. What are you doing there? He asked, sitting on his haunches and resting one side of his milk-filled belly on the ground. I'm meditating. What's that? I'm watching my breath as it hits my upper lip. Can I try it too? Yes, if you like. He flopped by her side and imitated her posture. No sooner he sat by her than Sudhu's barking was heard in the distance. I think your mother is calling you. Do go, Suki said. But the pup was trying hard to watch his breath and trying to feel it on his upper lip. All the while, Sudhu's barking became louder and closer. Finally, she came up to the bow tree and surveyed them, her whole body trembling with rage. Didn't you hear me calling? Come here at once, she scolded the pup. As he got up and trotted towards her, she glared at Suki before stomping away. After some time, though the pups had been doing well, they suddenly succumbed to a terrible purging illness. They became dehydrated and very ill. Suki couldn't bear to see them ill and shriveling up. She went quietly up to Sudhu. You must eat those herbs that grow near the jack tree by the hedge, she advised. Then, when they drink your milk, they will get cured. Thank you, Sudhu said coldly. But the monks are treating them. In any case, I am the mother, and I should know better than anyone else what to give my children and when to give it to them. Besides, it is very important that my children understand who is the authority around here. Of course, said Suki, flushing. Isn't there anything I can do? Shall I make a vow and pray for them? Don't worry. Every minute of the day I am praying for my children. What is more effective than a mother's prayers? Yes, we don't like others coming and interfering and undermining our authority. Kalu, who had arrived there, remarked. Remember, we are in control here. Suki retired to the bow tree and sat down dejectedly. Why are you running to see those pups all the time? Kapuri asked her over the crenellated wall. Didn't we advise you to leave Suddhu alone and get on with your practice? But should we not help others when they are in trouble? 
only if they want our help. But why do they dislike my wanting to help? What on earth do I do or say to give them the impression that I'm trying to undermine their authority? All they think of is who is in control here. Hierarchy. No matter what you say or do, whatever your motives are, they will interpret your words and actions to suit their own mental constructs. So leave them alone and get on with your practice. What hurt Suki was how Kalu also had changed towards her. In the past, he used to exchange a few cordial greetings with her now and again, but not anymore. Now, as he passed her by under the bow tree, he would scowl and glare at her. There seemed to be a simmering anger inside him, and Suki was at a loss to understand why. His aggressiveness increased when other male and female dogs came to talk on the Dhamma with Suki. Once, when Suki went towards the back courtyard of the temple, she overheard Sudu bending Kalu's ears with an unabashed tirade. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Do you call yourself a dog or a mouse? Why don't you assert yourself and drive away all those riffraff who come in here? Why should I? Can't you see that they are bringing in all kinds of diseases? No wonder the pups are falling ill all the time. All because of that creature sitting under that bow tree, pretending to be a great saint. After that, Kalu became more aggressive towards Suki's circle of Dhamma friends. He barked unceasingly at newcomers and even got into scuffles with them. Once he had a right royal fight with a well-built dog and they would have fought unto death if the monks and stewards had not come running out and doused the two dogs with buckets of water. Kalu had his ears torn and several injuries. Suki was very frightened, but Sudu was proud of Kalu. Now her faithful listeners will think twice about coming in here. Sudu told Kalu, licking his wounds and nuzzling him. I'm so proud of you. Even the pups are beside themselves with admiration for you. Suki was very downcast. More so because during the dogfight she overheard one steward putting the blame on her. She's the cause of all of this. We should have not let her stay here. A female dog means trouble and more pups. Shall we drive her away? Fortunately for her, the chief monk did not let them drive her away. True, a female dog means pups. But we must not be unkind and add to her misfortune of being a female. Let her be. Carlo will see that no stray dogs come in. Besides, she is very docile and well behaved. We should not harm a harmless animal. Let us hope she will be born a male dog in her next birth, the steward said. Suki's ears burned when she heard those words, but Kapuri only chuckled. These men, she whispered to Suki, they think no end of themselves, don't they? They think they are the cat's whiskers. But see how Suddu manipulates Kalu. Still, it's a man's world, isn't that so? Suki replied. It's neither a man's nor a woman's world. What matters is how we live according to the Dhamma. That is the Buddha's teaching. But I have suffered much as a result of being a female, Suki reflected. Have you? Kapuri turned a sympathetic ear toward her. To begin with, I was a very sickly pup. Apparently, I had diarrhea which would not stop. My mother thought I was destined to die and so discarded me. But she would have done that even if you were a male, Kapuri pointed out. Well, anyway, a kind woman saw me in a ditch, still alive, and took me into her house and nursed me with loving care till I became strong again. But then 
Her husband drove me away. He drove me away because I was a female. Oh, dear. What we women have to go through, eh? So then what happened? I had to eke out a miserable existence on the road. The kind women used to come and give me a little food, but I was lucky if I could eat it by myself. You know what it is like to live among stray dogs on the streets. I got used to leading a very marginalized life, slinking into temples quietly, and when driven out, going to another. So that is how you took to meditating and leading a religious life? The tortoise asked. He had sidled up to them while they were talking and was quietly listening to their conversation. Yes. And you never had pups? Yes, I did. My husband was the leader of a pack and he was very kind to me. But one day he was picked up by the municipal van and taken to the dog pound with some others. We all bolted when we saw the van driving up and the municipal laborers jumping out to catch us. We ran for dear life. But my husband was nearest the van, and they caught him, my pups, and some other dogs. When I think of my loss, there is a great pain in my chest. And so you finally came here? Yes. Someone told me of this quiet, out-of-the-way temple. It is really a haven for the likes of me. My dear, this temple and our religious path is for everyone, not only for the likes of you. Our path brings peace and tranquility to everyone. Well then, especially for those like myself, who have had to lead such miserable, unfortunate lives. You see, Though I have lived on the streets all my life, I am a very sensitive creature. I am not impressed by sensitive creatures, Kapuri said, wrinkling her trunk. Unless they are sensitive to the feelings and sufferings of others too. Very often, being sensitive means nothing more than having a heightened notion of an ego. It is... Very difficult to get rid of the sense of ego, Suki murmured. How can one do it? The tortoise came closer to Suki in order to advise her. Go on, purifying your mind. Go on observing and monitoring your thoughts, analyzing your motives. Watch yourself when you are hurt. Self-knowledge and understanding oneself helps. We must always remember that there is nothing permanent within us. We are a mere process, a flow of passing physical and mental phenomena, emotions, concepts, ideas, memories. We must not try to attach an I or an agent to all that. Sometimes the mind reacts with craving and excessive attachment to people and things. Sometimes it flits from one kind of sense pleasure to another in a world bent only on gratifying the senses. And when not gratified, flitting somewhere else. These are the forces and tendencies which keep us in samsara, clinging to sense desires and the ego notion. Each time you experience the emotion of hurt, become aware of the ego notion receiving a shock, as it were. Focus your mind on that sensation. Ask yourself, why you are reacting in that way. Self-examination is like a drop of water on a rock doing its work of eroding it little by little. 
That is why awareness and mindfulness are emphasized so much on the path to liberation from the self. This dukkha fraud, dukkha causing selfhood. You see, when you suspect that you are being shortchanged or bypassed, or when someone makes a derogatory remark about you, the reaction is predictable. You react with anger. Some people are very sensitive to such assaults on the ego. But there is nothing very great about being hypersensitive. But surely one must have some self-respect. Of course. But the best kind of self-respect comes from an awareness that one is practicing the Dhamma not practicing one-upmanship. Practicing the Dhamma gives one a considerable amount of poise and stability. But of course, I don't mean a feeling of self-righteousness. You must realize that you are never perfect till the end of the path is reached. If you go about always ready to react every time someone makes a hurtful remark and you flare up in anger, it is like physically running a hundred miles away. Then if, from your stand a hundred miles away, again something is said or done or not said or done, to which you take umbrage, It is like running another hundred miles. Or you may retrace your previous mileage through motives of attachment and clinging. Are you not then ridiculous, flying back and forth, with aversion one moment and attachment the next? So, how can one stop this flying back and forth? By the practice of mindfulness and concentration. It steadies the mind and enables one to think calmly and clearly. Have you not heard the following stanza? He whose mind does not flutter by contact with worldly contingencies, sorrowless, stainless and secure, This is the highest blessing. But why does one get hurt in the first place? I see you have not understood. Let me put it this way. We grasp these changing physical and mental phenomena we call I so firmly that we make ourselves believe we are a permanent entity. If someone exposes some fault in us, our first reaction is to deny it or to defend ourselves, all because of this attachment to the mental construct we have of ourselves. If we do not cling so much and maintain our objectivity, we can face changes very much more calmly and rationally. It is the same with the views and beliefs we hold. We must not have a passionate hold on anything. That is, if you are really bent on renunciation. What about the view that we are a mere process? Are we not holding on to that belief? Don't hold on to it. Experience the truth of it by observing the nature of this changing phenomena we call an I and a me, that awareness will loosen the grasping of the aggregates, the notion of an abiding ego entity. Suki practiced purifying her mind very diligently, according to the way Kapuri and the tortoise had instructed her. Soon it became apparent to all that Suki was making good progress. Her progress in meditation and her kindness to others drew many to her. 
Since the canine species were vehemently denied access to the temple premises by Kalu, other species like birds and squirrels began to come to Suki for meditation guidance and solace. But unfortunately, as time went on, she became so engrossed in focusing attention on the problems of others and their defilements that she neglected to continue the practice of monitoring and purifying her own thoughts. Gradually, there began a slow change in her personality. Sudhu was the first to notice this change in Suki and would openly comment on Suki's increasing smugness bordering on arrogance. Sudhu's blatant derision influenced Kalu to snarl and growl at Suki even more than usual whenever he happened to pass her by. Once, Kalu came deliberately up to her, snarled in a most insinuating manner and snatched away a bone that was near her paw. Suki did not remonstrate, but turned and looked up at Kapuri, who was standing near the crenellated wall that surrounded the bow tree, munching on some branches at her feet. Did you see what he did? she inquired of Kapuri. Yes, I did. Why are people so envious and jealous of me? Are they? Kapuri smiled. Didn't you see what Kalu did? Yes, but was he motivated by envy and jealousy? Then? My dear, you know the Dhamma as well as I do. Are you still observing your own motives and thoughts with the same intensity as you used to? Why do you ask that? Well, we all have varying degrees of defilements, don't we? All stemming from asmimana, pride of the self. Am I not right? Yes, but what are you driving at? We must constantly keep ourselves under observation, not only others. In fact, let others be our mirror, wherein we may discover our own defilements. Suki bent her head and began to quietly bite through the short fur on her paws with the rapid short clipping motion of a barber's razor. There were no ticks on her body, but she felt ashamed and wanted to hide her face. Kapuri turned away with great delicacy of feeling. Some days later, Suki heard that the pup with the black patch over one eye had fallen ill again. Kapuri told her that the chief monk had instructed a steward to take the pup to a veterinarian in town. Later, he was brought back after the necessary injections and drips had been given him. Suki lost no time in paying a visit to Sudhu and her pups. I was very sad to hear about your pup. How is he? she asked. Better, was the cold rejoinder. He used to come and meditate at the bow tree with me, Suki said. Sudhu stiffened. He doesn't like you, she snapped. He likes Kapuri. He adores her. Suki couldn't believe her ears. Sudhu's rudeness cut through her like a knife. For a moment, she puzzled over what Sudhu had said and then quietly got up. Well, she said, I shall get along now. I hope the pup will be better soon. When she went to her usual place under the bow tree, she found Kapuri by the wall. Sudhu says the pup loves you very much. Suki said, the tears welling in her eyes. I'll never forget how he used to dart away from the others and come prancing out here to exchange a few words with me. You still haven't learned to let go, have you? Kapuri mumbled, shaking her head dolefully. Suki looked up, startled. It is I and me and mine all over again, isn't it? How much the little fellow likes you 
or how much he likes someone else more or how much you feel his absence. Suki broke down. Do tell me, how can I get rid of this attachment to myself? It makes me suffer so. Examine yourself with self-searching honesty, constantly. Meditation will help. Then only can you let go of the entire grasping of these five aggregates called a being. I couldn't bear to see the pup so ill. He was such a lively bundle of fur, prancing and tumbling about with the others. They're all such a joy to see. You are letting your notion of an ego come into your concern for the pups, aren't you? Notion of an ego? Aren't you being unfair? The ego notion is a dangerous thing, Kapuri continued in a tone of mild reproof. It works in a very subtle way, infiltrating all our thoughts and actions, sometimes almost unknown to oneself. Tentacles are put out for the purpose of clinging to living beings or things, clinging to I and me and mine. Try to intercept that clinging. How? By being conscientiously and consistently mindful. By examining your thoughts and actions with ruthless honesty. Suki sat down and a mood of deep shame overcame her. Presently, she emerged from her mood of shame and self-censure and became absorbed in the intense peace and cleanliness of the precincts. There were some avocado trees and other fruit trees and flowering trees in the well-swept premises of the temple. They surrounded the bow tree like disciples round a teacher. The bow tree was decorated with multicolored flags. The disciple trees seemed to be posturing in various statuesque attitudes holding up their luxuriant crowns, some decked with fruit. They were silent, but still expressive of peace and fulfillment and reverence. The cooing of doves and pigeons and the chirping of birds and crickets, not to mention the raucous cawing of crows, caught Suki's ears from varying distances. Hearing the sounds of the birds and smelling the scents of the temple flowers, she began to delve deeper and deeper, seeking the peace that comes when the mind turns within, the wisdom that arises through realizing the egoless nature of all things. This has been the Struggle of Letting Go, a story by Suvimali Karunaratna, narrated by Sophia Oja, with Christoph Enslin. Copyright 1999, Buddhist Publication Society. Audiobook Copyright 2017, Pariyati. Pariyati a non-profit 501c3 organization offers a wide variety of books, ebooks, videos, and audiobooks about the teachings of the Buddha, the Pali language, and Vipassana meditation. Browse our complete catalog at www.pariyatti.org. That's pariyatti.org.